Welcome to the Startup Grind. So we have both myself, John Muller, and Patty Glazer here. So thank you very much for coming tonight. So this is Startup Grind Kalamazoo, a chapter of Startup Grind, which was started back in 2010 out in Silicon Valley by Derek Anderson and crew. Um, I was looking at some of the numbers that we have within Startup Grind now. We actually have 175 chapters, right? That's pretty nice there. Yeah. And that's around the world in 60 to 70 countries there. And we actually have already put on 1,000 events this year. And that's as last year we had only 800. So we've gone from 1,000, or sorry, from zero in 2010 to over 1,000 this year in 2005 after five years. So um, Startup Grind is now being called the United Nations of Startups. And so we're actually in Tel Aviv, we're in uh, London, we're in Cape Town, South Africa, we're in Melbourne and other places. So, and actually we are in Kalamazoo. We have three chapters in Michigan, here in Kalamazoo, Lansing and Detroit. And so we try to work together with that uh, group here. And so I know Stacy, who's part of the team, was over with the Detroit group, um, listening to Matt Miller and the founder of um, Qualtrics, uh, Ryan Smith. Yes, very good. So. Um, and basically, Matt Miller is with Sequoia Venture Capital, and then you have um, Ryan Smith, who's actually with Qualtrics, which is valued at over a billion dollars. So, so speaking of investments, we actually have Patty Glazer here. Let's give her a hand here, please. All right. All right. So, so, so Patty is not Sequoia, so you kind of got the low end of the deal there. <laughs> So, but you are in Michigan, though, so that, that's great. And, so, and that's what we care about right now. So um, from Invest Detroit, and so she Detroit, you know, drove over from Detroit. And so people are wondering why she would come to Southwest Michigan to talk to entrepreneurs and other people in the startup community. And so that's going to be some of the conversation that her and I are going to have over the next 30 to 45 minutes as we sit here and chat like we're sitting in front of a fire or drinking coffee at a coffee shop. So my goal is to make Patty feel comfortable. So we actually have a nice little conversation over that 30 or 45 minutes. And then after that, we'll open up to questions for about 10 or 15 minutes. So you get to ask your specific questions there. So before we get going, I want to make sure you understand the purpose of Startup Grind. All right? It's to connect and inspire and educate people in the startup community. So if we don't do that tonight, then we haven't uh, done our job. So, all right, Patty, the first question here, okay, is that, what do you do with Invest Detroit? What is that all about? Sure. And can I break format a little bit? Absolutely. Um, so as I'm going along and as I'm talking, if it's okay with you, if you have questions, because clearly I came here to try to be a resource to you folks, and I really appreciate the opportunity to come here and be a part of the session. It's so important that we come together as communities to really push forward um, these startup efforts. So thank you for being here. And please, if you have a question as we're talking, don't. I don't think we need to wait to the end. Can they just raise their hand? Absolutely. And, if you're yes. open with that, that'd yeah. be good. Yeah. I'm more than happy yeah. with that. So what do I do at Invest Detroit? So I am a venture investor, which means that I'm investing in early stage um, startup companies here in the state. And we're doing um, tech startups, most, you know, few high growth. Um, but I have two funds. Do you want me to go into this one? Okay. So I have two funds. The first fund is called the First Step Fund. And that was started about five years ago with the intent to really be a pre-seed, early seed fund. And so we've done over 70 investments out of that fund. Um, and all Michigan companies, a couple have moved out. Um, and we continue to invest at about $50,000 per company with follow-on opportunities of about 100000 Our second fund, which technically um, I'm just closing this month for the first time, um, but we've already done uh, nine investments out of, is a second stage fund. So we are covering the pre-seed and sort of real early seed fund gap in the state with the first step fund. And now we're focusing on that 750 to $2 million gap funding that's still here in terms of really taking a company into growth mode. And so that's a traditional fund versus the first step fund is an evergreen model. So as we get funds back into the fund, we continue to reinvest 
The second fund is a traditional 10-year fund where we need to provide returns to our investors, which include both um, philanthropic dollars, private investors, and state funding. So it's a mixture of all those type of funders, but we need to return our funds back to our original investors. So that's kind of a high level of the, the two funds that I'm running. So, so who are the investors that are willing to put up money? Uh, be, be local investors then? Yeah, so the private investors that we do have in the fund are um, local high wealth individuals who are very invested in the types of companies we're growing here in the state. So they do believe in the model that you can have an all Michigan fund, that you can have a fund based on technology here in the state and at the level where we're playing, sort of that filling in, again, that gap funding that they're not a lot of venture investors. So we've got sort of the angel funds who are playing at the seed early stage um, funding realm. Um, you certainly have individual in, uh, individuals as well, but there's a lack of venture funds, institutional funds that are really able to kind of come in, lead around, put in the board governance, really set the stage to help the company grow to that next uh, phase of investment. So just Detroit, or are you actually looking at the entire state now? Yeah, so we do, so the First Step Fund has a primary interest in Southeast Michigan, um, but we are doing investments across the state. So we've got a couple investments in Grand Rapids. I think we've tried to do a couple investments here in Kalamazoo, haven't quite gotten over the hurdle yet, but certainly it's it's open. Um, but the majority, because of the the uh, evergreen fund status, it was started by philanthropic organizations that are focused on Southeast Michigan. That's the primary focus. Um, Detroit Innovate was set up as geographically neutral in the state of Michigan. So we could do anything in the UP, we could do it here, we could do it regardless of where you are. Um, it's really hard to have a 10-year venture fund. I'm sure Jack has <laughs> peppered you with stories on that. And so in order, since, um, you know, we're geographically constrained and just Michigan itself is a pretty big constraint. Um, so we, for that reason, we invest across the state as well as across a variety of industries, which we can talk about. So just to give a flavor of which companies you invested in, which ones are you talking about that you invested in Grand Rapids? Who would that be? So in Grand Rapids, and I think you've had um, speakers here. So you've had uh, Ryan Vaughn and his wife, Laura Vaughn. Um, so Varsity News Network, um, Blackbird, RSVP. We have Sportsman Tracker um, around that side of the state. And I think, so again, now I'm, I'm managing about 79 companies across the two <laughs> portfolios. I think that's the, the Grand Rapids continuum right now. And so those are all tech companies in terms of information technology pieces there. Now, Kalamazoo is known for life sciences and so forth. Have you done any investments in life sciences and healthcare in general with the two funds so far? Yep. So we have um, a couple life science companies um, and uh, across the two funds. So I'm not going to count the digital healthcare IT, but in terms of just sort of pure life science, um, we are involved in Mina Such's latest um, company, Gemfire Therapeutics. Um, we're also pretty heavily involved in De Novo Sciences, um, and we're involved with both of our funds in De Novo. So that is um, Kaylin Handik, who did Handy Lab, um, who had sold that to Johnson & Johnson a couple of years back. Um, he has, he's a microfluidics expert, has started a company called De Novo Sciences, soon to be Sal C. Um, that is focused on um, cancer diagnostics. So looking at trying to pull out CTC, C's out of the blood to um, find uh, cancer that's metastasized. Um, and we have a couple other diagnostics. Um, uh, Delphinius, um, we were not in Proni, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but yeah, we certainly, um, we do understand that life science takes a lot of time and a lot of um, a lot of knowledge. So we typically we wouldn't be a lead investor in one of those type of rounds. Um, though we do have advisory committees, Jack, <laughs> um, that you know sit 
with our fund to help us evaluate some of the different industries that we might not be as familiar with. So again, in life sciences, we wouldn't take the lead because it's just beyond our capacity, um, but we certainly can add on into those deals and really try to give the company enough capital to hit the milestones that they need. So do you invest by yourself or do you come with syndicates in any of these companies? Right now, most of the deals we do are all syndicates. Um, so now we'll often take the lead in forming a syndicate. So we have many groups that we work with quite frequently. And if I, you know, pick up the phone and say, hey, Grand Angels, or hey, you know, this fund or that fund, can you take a look at this? I think this fits your profile. Um, usually we can build a, a, a syndicate for a company fairly fast, depending on the type of company it is. Um, but so either we're leading the syndicates or we're following on. And again, so we're putting in about 50 into a round of 150 to 500 with the first step fund. And typically we're putting in 100 to 250 with our second fund into rounds that are a million to 3 million. So often that puts us, you know, we are trying to, um, and that's been the strategy around the state um, pretty much is building that syndicate. So as your companies need these next round of fundings, um, we were just talking earlier, there's now a growing gap. So we've got an okay amount of seed funding. We've got an okay base of A funding, but sort of this late A, B round where a company gets to about one and a half, two million um, in revenue if you're IT, uh, life science equivalent would be um, you know, um, pre-FDA trial, you know, use that as an example, um, but where they're close. So they're making really good progress. They certainly are scaling their revenue, but for the large funds who need to deploy, you know, eight to 15 million in one shot because they've got very large funds and we have a very large fund, you have to deploy lots of capital in, you know, big amounts. So they... Um, they're looking for companies who are already at that $5 million in revenue. And so we're struggling here in the state right now with companies who are sort of in that 2 to $5 million range. And so we're having to do a lot of funding within the original syndicate. So if I'm alone and I invest, let's say, $1 million and a company needs another million, that's all on my shoulder to bear. Where if I go in and I've got a couple partners at the table and they need one more million, we can each split it up based on how we did that first million. So it just allows us to provide companies a little bit more s stability as they grow because you don't know exactly when they're going to hit the milestones where the next round investors are going to be attracted. You can guess, and often it's fairly educated guess, but so many things happen along the startup path and so, you know, so much up and kind of down that it's really hard to predict with great accuracy. Well, let's talk about the startup path then. Um, after you invest, how much do you get involved in the decisions of the company or the strategy or the vision of the company? And can you give a couple examples where it went good and it went bad, how it went sour? Yeah, so um, we get involved, you know, with 77 companies, I certainly could not get involved with every company to a great extent. I really let it play out by the individual entrepreneur and the company. So if our team has a certain expertise, we'll talk to the entrepreneur about that. Um, but we often find that entrepreneurs, there will be a handful at any given time that are really aggressively looking for help in a certain area. So, um, you know, we've had... You know, recently I've had a company going through kind of high scaling, trying to find that next round investor. And this is where often I play because um, of my background. I have a good network of um, potential late next round venture funds. But I was trying to find that next venture round, but also scaling. So um, spent a lot of time with the company. I still spend a lot of time with this company in terms of, okay, who do we source the talent from? Let's find that talent. Um, and then also on the investment partner side, you know, introducing them to folks that were not in their 
know, that they didn't know. And again, that warm introduction and saying, hey, here's a great company. Um, ironically, um, the last uh, one of those I did for a company, um, the to the CEO and the investor were actually good friends, but had never thought to talk to each other about whether they should be investing. <laughs> I said, hey, I was having a meeting. Have you thought about investing in this company? And the venture partner was like, no, but I'm going down to the ballpark with the CEO, you know, in a couple hours. Let me go, <laughs> you know, I'll talk to him. And sure enough, you know, a couple months later, the deal was done. So funny, even if it's not, doesn't have to be a new investor, but sometimes it's just that connection point. So very frequently connection point between talent, other investors, between potential um, partners or customers, just being able to make those warm intros to folks. Um, and again, on the on the talent and scaling side. So prior to investing, I spent about, well, I'm fairly old now, but there's um, <laughs> kind of after I got my MBA, I went and did a little bit of venture, but then I spent over 10 years operating companies. Um, so I've been the COO, I've been a CFO, I've been a CEO. Um, so I really understand sort of the challenges that companies face. And so being able to roll up my sleeves and be able to help, whether it's look at financials or be able to talk about cash flow, talk about how, you know, what things you need to be thinking about, you know, and um, just there's so many things that my job as a board member or advisor typically are to help my company see what they might not see ahead of them and to plan for the things that they think are impossible or you know, they're on, just to think, again, about making sure that they're covering all the, kind of all the critical, um, not that they cover all the critical things, but just trying to think through all the different things that might happen over the next course of the next 12 to 18 months. So, so you kind of dodged the question a little bit there in terms of the second part, in terms of where has it gone wrong and you've been, you know, weren't able to, to fix it based upon your knowledge or your background. And how that make you feel? Yeah, I wasn't dodging as I was just trying to, you know. Um, so I'll go back to, so prior to Investitory, I was with a company called Arsenal Venture Partners. And um, we did a lot of work in uh, energy, um, industrial technology work. And had a company in our portfolio um, that I wasn't on the board, but I was active as an observer and was working with the company. I don't, um, more as uh, board direction, I would say, and the ability to connect, trying to connect this company to the companies that would move it forward was not successful. Um, and it's not our job necessarily to be the salespeople, but in order to if we can use our connections, um, you know, I've worked with a lot of utilities and different you know, folks in the energy sector, I really thought that we'd be able to open more doors for the, the company going forward. Um, so I know that's not really a great example, but I'll keep thinking. When I come up with a really good, like, oh my gosh, I, I don't think I've ever destroyed a company. Uh, <laughs> But I'm really cautious too, right? So I am not a type of investor that's going to say, you need to do X, Y, Z. Because what do I know, right? I have my context. I have, you know, I am an advisor. I'm part of a board, and often is the case. But my goal is to enable the CEO to make the best decisions for their company. I'm not trying to dictate how that company runs or operates. Um, and I think it's very important that you understand the type of investors, if you're going, bringing investors around the table, what is their expectation as an investor? Do they see themselves as, hey, you know, we're going to control this company and you're along for the ride? Or is it more of a, hey, we're here to support you and your growth and the company? And again, things go wrong. They always do with different companies, but when they do go wrong, hopefully there's a strong enough relationship between the investor, the board, and the management team where it, you know, they can be resolved in a constructive way. 
Okay, let me rephrase the question then. So, all right. Um, what funny activities have happened when someone's coming to pitch you in, in with a business? That is like, why are they even here? Yeah, I, um, just the other day, I had someone come in and ask for $1 million with, you know, pre-product, really, um, with a $19 million pre-money valuation. Um, and so that's like totally, I mean, we value companies at my stage at, you know, somewhere between one and three million on average, right? Sometimes it's a little higher, but it's really low. So it's just that um, expectation um, that, yeah, hey, we're worth 19 million. We've got, you know, 5,000 in services that we've sold. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's probably one of the, um, biggest deal killers for potentially very good tech in this area. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, if they attended groups like this and they attended, so my fund, I believe, my funds are early stage, so I believe a big role of mine is to help educate. So if someone tells me their valuation is crazy, I'm not going to say, okay, walk away. I'll say to them, hey, do you want to come back? And let's sit down and let's go through your deck and let's talk about why, you know, this pitch may not play with the other folks in town. But with most VCs, you don't get that um, second chance. And so being able to work within these different mechanisms that, you know, the, the um, you know, certainly startup grind, there's, you know, different accelerator programs or different groups that can help level set where you can say, oh, here's my 10 slide deck. Does that, you know, does this look normal enough? You know, are there, is there any huge red flags that somebody's gonna point out? Because there are things, standard things that we expect to see. Um, you know, I've had so many crazy <laughs> meetings, but not in a bad way, right? It's, um, People have passions and they have ideas. They're not going to be a fit with everyone you talk to. Um, but the fact that you're out there and people are trying to seek funding for their dream or their vision, um, I, I find that I have great respect for that. I think that there's, um, you know, again, not going to be, every fund's not going to be a match for everyone. But if you have a passion and you're out there trying to help find a way for it forward, that's a great thing. So it goes back to your background then. I mean, I think you're working with Accenture uh, for a while. You graduated from graduate school. You moved around a little bit. You were in Austin for three or four years. Um, now in Detroit, the last uh, four or five years, you came back uh, to the Michigan area. How do you compare, you know, your operating backgrounds in the different areas with what you're seeing in Michigan over the last three or four years? Yeah, so I had this great career path of starting off in IT, moving into um, nanotech, then energy and industrial technologies, um, and then back to investing. So I never thought that I would able, be able to put advanced materials and energy, industrial, and IT together. Uh, oh, and actually, I, um, one of my operating roles was at a healthcare IT company, so I got a little bit of healthcare like thrown in there. Um, so that ability, um, and so I worked for Accenture when I graduated from undergrad, so that was um, sort of my first part of my career. Um, but it's really enabled me to think through um, sort of the scalability and ease of IT, but have a super passion for the hard tech stuff. I love things. I love things that are hard to make. Um, but having watched that investment space for the past decade, it's really, really hard, right? So as an investor, you have to go in with the mindset, if you're going to do a hard tech thing, and this applies to life sciences, um, you know, it's going to take a lot longer than anybody thinks. So if you think it's going to take five years, it's going to take 10. I think it's going to take 10 years. It could take 15, 20. Um, there's just so many things that come up in those paths in that path of delivering um, uh, the 
kind of the, the hard tech stuff outside the software, um, that I just have a much more kind of conservative view in terms of time. So I always look, okay, you say three years, I'm going to add five, and okay, does that make sense? <laughs> and it's okay, um, but it's just because of my background and seeing kind of all these different sectors play together. Um, I don't think I really answered your question very well. But no, you answered the part of it. So let's let's bring the connection between, for example, Austin, where I'm originally from, for example, and then Detroit, and look at what's happened in the community there and how you are seeing the mentality of people in those areas in operating those companies and bring your operating expenses or experience into the investing world. Yeah, so I've had the fortune of um, in the kind of the past few years, um, right before coming back to Arsenal, working in Boston and Austin. And um, Austin clearly the most similar in terms of um, a younger entrepreneurial community, um, so not um, fully baked yet, and still really, you know, the university incubators being really critical, the city playing a strong role in, you know, trying to encourage different sector growth. Um, you know, they had, uh, were very active in the clean energy sector at the time. Their local utility was municipally owned, so the city and the utility and the universities often interacted really well together. Um, and that kind of step in step, kind of hand in hand, certainly I see that in Ann Arbor, um, and, um, and less the city part, but certainly the university and the incubators and sort of that community is really strong. And that's what Austin does really have um, going for it. Um, and a youth, right? So they're attracting, it's just a very cool culture. So they're attracting lots of young people who not exactly sure where they're going to go. Um, but hey, let's go to Austin because it's a cool city. And it is a cool city. There's, um, it's a, a great place to be. Um, Detroit has a slightly edgier vibe, but it's also attracting the huge art community, which also was an early start in Austin, right? So Austin had a lot of artists at the beginning before the tech culture really started to um, take place. So I think you see Detroit starting to bring in that artist community, starting to come back from an opportunity in terms of the neighborhoods are starting to get developed. It's not just midtown and downtown. It's starting to extend, and they're really pushing the development out. Um, and people are willing to stay. So for, you know, I get resumes all the time of people who want to come back to Michigan. They hear that things are happening here. They want to be a part of it. Um, I think the last part was my bring my operational experience. Um, I just, I, I think I apply the factor of, I know what it's like to not make payroll or to think I'm not going to make payroll and waiting like a couple days before to know, am I going to make payroll or am I not going to make payroll? So I always come with my companies of transparency, and I found that the more transparent I was with my employees about exactly what was happening at any given time, and that everything, you know, if I was giving you full information and you're making your decisions based on that full information, you know, we'll either keep plugging along together or you'll find something that better fits what you need. And I find that works well with investors too or your people that are around you. That often a CEO has the weight of the world on their shoulders. They don't have, you know, the people that they feel, can I share this problem or that problem? And it's, yeah, it's hard, right? You're shaking your head. It's, it's a really lonely place to be. But if you're transparent about things and you open yourself to ask questions, my best CEOs are the ones who are never afraid to pick up the phone and ask me a question. Or I can pick up the phone and ask them a question. I've learned so much from, you know, the companies that I work with um, beyond. So it's, again, I would say it's that having been there, knowing the struggle, being accepting of the ups and downs in the companies, but also asking for, you know, just op open honesty and transparency because that's the only way we can truly work 
to move the company forward over time. Um, and that's been my sort of policy. That's worked for me. It may not work for others, but that's what's worked for me. So let's talk about uh, your time at Arsenal versus Invest Detroit. Uh, what's the culture like in the two different organizations, and how has your investment criteria changed between the two when you're actually going to put money into a company? Yep, so uh, Arsenal ran a couple of funds. So they were running, or they still run, um, they ran a Florida fund similar to some of the Michigan funds around here. They run the Army's venture fund as well as a traditional um, venture fund. So it was a $70, $70 million fund, the traditional one, um, really looking at, um, you know, in theory, it was sort of this intersection between defense and the commercial marketplace, but broadened out, broadened out from from there. Um, but Arsenal was looking at A to C round investments, so they wanted to put in a million to two to three million in deals that were, you know, already past sort of the, and you know, already in sort of the high growth trajectory. Um, and they were looking at things from a national viewpoint. So when we we would get on Dean screening calls every week, and I was actually managing Michigan and Hawaii. <laughs> Long story. We can go back to that if you ever want. Um, but you know the the deals in both those locations, when you had to stack them up against the best deals in California or Boston or you know some some of the Chicago. Um, it was more difficult to move companies through the process. Um, and the headquarters was based in Florida. So I was based in here. So there's also, um, you know, being able to communicate with a fund directly face to face um, and with your partners face to face. Um, Invest Detroit is much more my line of investing. So, which means, it's, I get to wrap up sort of the, the investing side, but I also get to use, I, I have a real passion for how to, I wouldn't call it educate, but that facilitating role. So if I can help use and leverage, you know, I've seen thousands of business plans, worked with hundreds of companies. Um, I'm a woman's entrepreneur instructor. I work with National i I really try to take those roles seriously in terms of how do we move companies faster through that pipeline. And I'm always fascinated by anything in terms of, you know, what are tools or techniques that move companies further and faster. And so I, my job is really now in Invest Detroit. Um, I'm looking at things much earlier and able to invest much earlier. So my criteria isn't, you know, have they, you know, do they have 50 customers? Is everybody happy? And all the SaaS metrics perfectly aligned um, so that we know the next, you know, funding round is a foregone conclusion, which it never is. <laughs> um, but it's really to take risks in the entrepreneurs and into the, the different technologies. I think often I get asked the question, you know, is it the team more important? Is it the technology more important? Is the market more important? What's the most important? And I usually say it's a continuum. So if you look at um, sort of a, a company that has really strong IP and really differentiated, could really change the world with just the IP alone on one side, and you take the other extreme on, on this end, which is execution. So they're not really doing anything really unique but it's about fast execution. And there's lots of those companies, especially in IT, right? Because there are millions of ways to code things. So if it's on the execution end, I'm gonna be looking for an extremely strong team. That team has to be rock solid. I have to know that they can beat everybody else at that game, right? Because there's gonna be at least 20 other players if I go through my deal database that are similar or that I've seen. So I'm really looking for that team that can, I, I feel, has proven to me, you know, proven either with other companies or has proven with what they've achieved so far that they have what it takes to execute. 
On the IP side, you know, the tech side, I'm really looking more at what does the customer pull from the market for that tech? What are the alternatives that that tech, um, that people, what are the alternatives that people can use that that tech is trying to solve? The team's important, um, but not as super critical because I can find good executive talent. If the technical talent's there, I can find good executive management talent. So it really depends on where you sit on that continuum, where that management team, you know, really becomes sort of that super critical point. Um, and what, you know, where do I look at, you know, when does technology and market become most important? I'm going to ask one more question before opening it up to the floor here. And that goes back to one of your last statements in terms of talent. Um, do you see an abundance of talents or a lack of talent right now in Michigan in the deals that you're investing in? Um, we don't have an abundance of talent. Um, we don't have no talent. Um, we have more talent by the day. Um, but we certainly struggle with certain areas. So we usually can find good CTOs. We can find um, good COOs. We struggle with vice presidents of product, folks who have done sort of these larger fast scale type companies. Um, we sometimes um, do struggle with the executive CEO being the right fit. Because you can't bring an executive CEO from one of the auto suppliers or who's done, you know, sort of these later stage companies. You have to find someone who is very comfortable rolling up their sleeves, able to punch out a marketing plan or deal with the sales issue or go talk to the customer or go, you know, just all the multitude of things that you can't pass on to somebody else when you're in a small company. And sort of trying to find that comfortable CEO who's able to do the 10 to 50 person company um, can be harder. It's not impossible, but it can be harder. And software talent, every one of my companies struggles with software IT development and finding the, the folks that they need. There's, you know, we're doing, we're running a program called Hacker Fellows Program where we're recruiting heavily out of the Michigan universities to match our startup, or our software graduate, or our computer um, graduates with startup companies to show them there's a career path, but so much more needs to be done in that direction. We really need to be um, creating this pipeline of our computer engineers into our startup companies. All right, I'm going to open up to the floor to questions. Who wants to ask Patty the first question? Dan, you get the opportunity. Very good. Hold on here. So you you started, you kind of did half of this question, but you, you said uh, from your previous experience, I don't have to have XXX, I don't have to have 50 customers, I don't have to have um, all these SaaS metrics set up before I invest. Now you're in Invest Detroit. You don't have to have that, but what, on the other side of that, like what are you looking for? What are What is the, at that, you know, 50K, the lowest level, what are you looking for? You talked about the continuum, but are there like, uh, you know, kind of a couple of milestones that you can give people. Yeah, and so this is, and I always struggle with this a bit because it is very sector specific, right? And Well, tell us for tech. Well, IT tech, like a software tech? Software tech, yeah. Okay. Um, so with software, I'm looking for an MVP. So I want to know, I want to be able to see that there's, actually a existing platform. It doesn't have to be pretty, and it doesn't have to be have all the feature set that you're planning on having, but it's got to, I have to know that you can get it to a basic platform. And I want to know who, who do you have committed to this? And to me, so being a National I-Corps um, instructor, I am really, really fixated on customer discovery. And so if people come to my office and say to me, I've built this thing, and now people, you know, fund me so that I can go get customers. 
you know, I will work pretty aggressively with them coaching wise to say, no, you, you don't need to have built your thing all the way. You know, you need to go show me who needs to have this thing and why. I spend a lot of time with my companies on that. Why do they need you? What problem are you solving? How big is that problem? Because if they can't articulate that, then to me, that's a huge red flag. Um, it, I don't care if it's a niche area, and I don't care if, you know, something slightly, you know, it's only going to be maybe a 20-person company, five, ten million dollars a year over the life, you know, when it, as it grows um, with my fifty thousand dollar, you know, with the small fund. But what I do care about is that they're going to be able to grow a strong business. And if you know the pain and you know the magnitude of the pain, you've got people who are. I've got you know one customer who's getting call or one um, investment where he's getting calls all the time with like. Hey, let me know when this is done. I need this. No need to know when it's done. And it's that type of, um, you can almost pre-sale. You have to be careful, right? But it's that generating of who has to have what you're building. And I really use that. Um, and those questions that I ask around how well do they know the customer that they're going to be selling to. I dive really deep. Now, if I feel they've got a great understanding, they've got a couple folks that I can call and talk to about that problem and why they're interested in this solution. Um, that'll move things super fast. Um, so it's, you know, again, at that early stage, you kind of have to go on. Is there market pull? Do they have something? Can they show they've built something at least to a, a point? Um, and it, grand, they're, you know, we look at the how much money will they need? So that would be another big thing. Um, often we say, okay. How much money do they need to get to that next milestone? So um, one thing we work very extensively with our investment committee on is, you know, if we give, if they get $200,000, does that get them 6 to 12 months or 12 to 24 months where they can then prove out what? And if they prove out X, and so that could be bringing on 10 customers, that could be, um, you know, scaling up X amount of transactions or, you know, just what are those milestones that another investor will go, another couple investors will go, wow, that's interesting. Yeah, let's, you know, let's dive in. Let's, let's see if we're going to take this forward. So it's about not stranding companies. And I think that's a, a big concern we all have in the Michigan venture community is getting enough dollars into a company that they can really get to those achievable milestones where they're raising money because they want to grow and not because they're desperate. And if they don't raise the money, you know, then they're going to go under because that you never want to raise money in, in that situation. I was just excuse me, wondering what um, do you kind of agree with the Angels uh, often put it out that they want to get one out of five things to really go. And many, many people give the statistics that 40 to 60 percent of entrepreneurial things fail. Uh, I have that's the one question. The other question is you're dealing only with accredited investors, I presume. What is the uh, value or what is the net worth of most of the people that you? do end up doing a deal with? All right. So the first question. Um, so typically in venture, you look at a third, a third, a third. So of 10 investments, um, a third is going to go under. A third is going to, eh, you know, you're not going to lose money on, but you're not going to make any money on. And then a third, you're going to get good returns. So that top third is going to return the fund. Um, and that's played out, I believe, statistically fairly accurately for the funds who are successful. <laughs> um, and again, it's, you know, it's real interesting because there's a real secondary market now um, for venture funds. So after a fund is done after 10 years, 
they can sell their assets to what they call a secondary fund. And a lot of these secondary funds have done phenomenal. That went really hot for a while, but now it's kind of overvalued. But again, it takes companies a fair long time. So you've got, you know, I'd probably add a fourth category, and maybe 25, 25, 25, 25, where that last 25 is just you don't know after 10 years. It's still growing or it's still moving along, but it, you don't have an exit, clear exit path for that yet. Um, your other question is about the accredited investors. And do you mean like folks who invest in our fund or, yeah. So yes, they would be, yeah. They're not investing into our fund with the idea that they're making their retirement. Um, it, I believe there's, you know, they're high enough wealth individuals where they're, to them, they're making an impact in the business, the startup community here in Michigan by investing in our fund. Um, well, I hope to provide a nice return to them. Um, they're, you know, they're not using these funds to pay pensions or, you know, go, you know, buy their retirement home with. This, this is more, hey, we want to have impact. I hope that changes over time, but that's the reality for right now. Um, you know, most of them are very, very low. But I do have some second and third entrepreneurs who have had companies and who are, you know, are investing back into their next companies. So I have a couple entrepreneurs that have put a, a quite a bit of money into their own own companies. But that's much more the exception. Normally, it's you know uh, um, a a lot of uh, bootstrapping and worrying about the um, mortgage and third mortgage and um, you know what they've leveraged to try to get their business started. Stacy, thank you for uh, what you've been doing. Great evening. I wanted to know how, if the, you could tell us a little history of Invest Detroit, and you know how that came into being. What what is its form? Is it not for, or is it a profit organization? Or I'm just a little bit behind yeah. the curve, I guess. No, and Invest Detroit has been around for about 20 years. Um, has had uh, different names. Um, Detroit Investment Fund, I think, was the uh, predecessor. Um, so Invest Detroit has nine funds. It's a nonprofit, but it has nine funds that are some for-profit and some nonprofit that sit underneath it. Um, it has done a ton of work in the city of Detroit, so that's why it's not as well known outside of the city. Most of the transactions, I wouldn't say by number, but by dollar size, have been in commercial real estate and commercial lending. So of 23 people on staff, um, only five of us are on the venture side, and the rest are, you know, we have some admin, but, you know, 15 or so are traditional bank lenders. Um, and so really looking at, you know, Investitory was started to, how do we fill in gaps? Um, and you know, so they would go into these projects and be the, you know, subordinate debt to get the, allow the developers to get some more traditional funding or bring other funding partners to the table. You know, Detroit obviously has had struggled with the value of the land assets and how to put together deals that make any economic sense can be challenging. So from, you know, Invest Detroit really got started on sort of that real estate lending, um, has then gotten much more active, though, on the commercial lending. And so um, now runs the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Fund. So companies who've been around for three years plus who have revenue of 400000 or more annually, which isn't a super high hurdle, um, but who are located in the Detroit area can access that Goldman Sachs fund. We have a retail loan fund. So we're getting much more active in, um, you know, some of, you know, I would say that most of that's more on the lifestyle or kind of traditional manufacturing side, um, but certainly filling in large gaps 
um, in the region. The best venture team was started um, back in 2010 because of the um, wanting to see a higher tech entrepreneurial cluster start to form in Detroit. Now, it wasn't focused solely on Detroit because in order to, you know, you need to have some density um, of companies in order to make a fund viable. Um, so it was became a much more of a regional fund and looking at how do we kind of see Detroit companies also leverage, you know, and support the Ann Arbor and sort of Plymouth and Grand Rapids. We extend into Grand Rapids, but there was enough. How do we build a strong set of companies where this is, you know, our, we'll know when we've made it when we've got, you know, dozens of companies who are entrepreneurs who are on their second, third, fourth companies. We're getting closer. This is so much better than when I was doing venture in the late 90s when there were five funds across the state that were investing. Now there's um, close to, I think there's 36 um, venture funds located in the state and there are close to 90 that are active funds who are active, who are doing deals within the state. So the amount of capital here um, you know, is certainly significantly improved. Um, but yeah, so it's a gap, Invest Detroit, sort of a gap funding um, organization, um, and we're filling in that venture funding where we continue to see gaps. I still see early seed, pre-seed, that gap hasn't gone away. We're starting to fill sort of that, you know, early A round C, you know, function. Um, I don't know, maybe there's a role for us to play in sort of that B gap funding as well, I'm not sure. Um, it's just a harder place to, to capital fill. Can I just do one follow-on? What, what you, you mentioned that the VC came um, kind of after or, or as the, the organization grew. What was the impetus or, or who, who brought that vision or that, that whole thing into being for uh, the organization so that the gap funding became something happening? And, and my, my questions are, are all stemming from how does that get replicated in a place like Kalamazoo or uh, southwest Michigan, of all places? So it was a very um, uh, uh, individual who's working for the state, of the, had been working for the state, um, Mahendra, his last name, Ramas, yes, Andy, um, <laughs> who um, was very passionate about startups, very passionate about the venture space. So worked with um, the uh, new enterprise or um, new economy initiative, which is part of the community foundation um, to seed this first, the first stop fund. So, Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'll ask the last question here and then we'll kind of convene afterwards. So, so Patty, what is missing in Michigan that you wish would be here um, over the next four or five years? So I, I alluded to it earlier, but I do want to see a couple additional exits that lead to not entrepreneurs who go retire to Florida, <laughs> but who go to work on their next set of ideas. And again, we've got a good handful of strong ones that have started, and we've got some more that are coming up the pipeline. But the more we see of that, where we've are breed, you know, people. What we're all, but I am starting to see people leave higher growth startups to want to do their own thing, and so it's that combination. So we have enough big startups where people are leaving the, to do their own startups, and we've got entrepreneurs who are now working on their second, third businesses. Just that that flow, right? And not all just you know brands making new, but they're coming in with some startup experience and who understand sort of that roller coaster ride and can not have to reinvent the wheel. Um, I want to see is more stable capital um, play. We are, you know, the state's been very supportive. Um, it's had a fund to fund that's really helped bring outside 
um, investors into Michigan and give visibility to the great companies that we are growing here. Um, there's some danger in, you know, that those funds are done. And now can we continue to bring, how do we give visibility to our companies and keep that capital attracted to Michigan? So stabilize sort of the A through C round funding in the state so that we know we can move companies through with our capital. We don't have to go to the West Coast. We don't have to go to the East Coast, just having that stable capital base. So those would be the my biggest kind of desires over the next couple of years. Patty, thank you very much. Give her a hand, right? Appreciate it. So, and, and, and Patty will, will stay around for a little bit before she heads back to the East. So again, thank you, Patty, for talking with us. We appreciate it. So Thank you again, for having so. me. I appreciate it.